Okay. I'm rolling. Clap. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Bah. <laughs> <laughs> 100th episode. All right. <laughs> no pressure, Brady. All right. Hi there, everyone. It's the 100th episode of Objectivity, and today we have one of the crown jewels of the Royal Society Collection. In fact, one of the crown jewels of all science. And this almost didn't happen for the most bizarre of reasons. But before we go into that, let's see what it is. This is one of the most exciting things you can imagine seeing. This is the manuscript of Isaac Newton's Principia. Principia Mathematica, Isaac Newton's great work, is one of the milestones of science. And if you ever had to put together a list of the great books, the ones that were significantly influential for human culture, not just for science, this would be right in there quite high up in the list, if not tippy top. All right, we're going to look at that in just a second. But first we want to talk about why this almost didn't happen. So the Royal Society had the right from the Crown to publish books, uh, and it would do this. And quite often at this period, very heavily illustrated books were expensive to produce. So when John Ray and Francis Willoughby decided that they wanted to try and capture everything in the living world through books, one of the things they did was a book of fishes. So they wanted to try to get everything, every fish in the sea, onto paper. Very expensive to do. All right, so this is around the time of Principia. Let's have a look at this fish book. Here we go. What's that say? It says Willoughby Historia Piscium. So this is Francis Willoughby, The History of Fishes. Here we go. Here's a very decorative title page. So you can see they're going fancy pants right from the start. Mm. You get your text, of course, but the really expensive bits were the creatures. Look wow. at Wow. That. that actually is pretty impressive. Mm. The plates were so expensive that quite often they would get people to sponsor them to pay money so that they could get their name on it. And you could probably see who paid for that one. Samuel Pepys. So Samuel Pepys famous for keeping a diary, of course, but he was president of the Royal Society about this time. So he paid for a lot of the plates in this book. I mean, this is a big book, lots of artwork. It's nice stuff. It's great. It's really good. Wow. How many of these were printed? They went, they went to town, didn't they? They printed a lot of them and they were kind of left with a few on site. And we can see some of what happened by looking at the Royal Society's council minutes from this period. So here you have some of the information on the publishing of the Book of Fishes. This is June 1686. Mm -hmm. Here we are, ordered that a Book of Fishes of the best paper, curiously bound in turkey leather, with an inscription of dedication, likewise five others bound also, be presented to the President. So it's been printed and made, and here's where things go a little bit wrong for them. Yeah. Edmund Halley, of course, is being employed by the Royal Society on various jobs. Yeah, super and famous, Halley's mm, Comet. That's right. And here at the start of the next meeting, they're still talking about books of the fishes to be delivered to booksellers and so on. So they're trying <laughs> to sell it, not quite working. <laughs> you can uh, see it's all falling apart, isn't mm, it? Yeah. So here we have the question being put concerning E. Halley's salary. The question being put whether E. Halley should have 50 books of the fishes instead of the 50 pounds ordered to him at the last council. Okay, so they've got so many of these fish books that yep. they can't get rid of. They're thinking, can we pay people's wages with fish books? That's right, yeah. And, and just to, to rub it in, uh, they, they think they're going to give him a gratuity because he's done such a good job. Ordered that E. Halley receive a gratuity of 20 other books of De Piscibus. Another 20. Tell us how this all fits into Principia and why the two are connected. Edmund Halley is the man who persuades Newton to begin to write down on paper his ideas about the universe. And eventually it will be the Principia Mathematica, which of course the Royal Society should publish. Unfortunately, the Royal Society doesn't have any money because it's been publishing the Book of Fishes. Therefore, Halley, unfortunately, gets the job of pretty much paying for it through the press. And that's what we've got here. This mm. is the manuscript copied out by Humphrey Newton. We don't know if he's a relation to Isaac Newton or not, but that's Probably. a whole other story. And this is what's going to go to the printers. Keith, right. can we take it out? Yes, so let's this, do it. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Yeah. So this is the big book. It's two actually books. in two volumes mm. here. We'll come to that in a minute. So here's the first volume. Look at this. So there's the title page. There we go. So Philosophia Naturalis. Principia Mathematica. I mean, we're talking about things like 
gravity here and this is yeah. laws of motion are in here inverse square law the good stuff this is amazing and here it is written out quite neatly but we've got to remember that this is a manuscript that's going to be used by the printers so we've got things being underlined little notes here and bits of text here so you can see that Halley and Newton are going through it they're correcting they're annotating they're telling the printers where to put the figures this is literally history in the making this is going to change the world this is going to get us to the moon Look at that thumbprint. I'm going to claim that's Isaac Newton's thumbprint. It's probably just a printer. It's a printer, probably. <laughs> <laughs> this is really remarkable. And we could go through all the pages here. There, there are certainly lots of them. It's in Latin. Yep. So I'm not going to read you any excerpts, unfortunately. One of the things I find very interesting, though, is we see here it's been bound into two volumes. Mm. But it wasn't originally two, was it? It was originally one. All. That's right, yeah. And it would have been quite a bulky volume, as you can imagine. So quite sensible to put it into two like this. And here's something you very rarely see. What's this, Keith? These are the original boards of the Principia. So when they made these fancy double volume, yep. they didn't just throw these in the bin. They knew how important this was, how valuable this was. So this yep. is the original spine and boards. It's a measure of the value of the book that they bothered to keep these things. There's the marbled end papers. Very nice, very pretty. Look at that. That's the original spine of the manuscript before they rebound it for obvious reasons. It's lovely that you kept it. Mm. So there we go. One last thing to show you, because obviously it went to print. We can't, just, we can't just have a handwritten version. No, in many ways the print version is more important because this is what people would have read. This is the first clue they would have had to what Newton was thinking. This is a first edition Principia. Here's the title page. Very iconic. People have probably seen this before. Yep, and you can read what's written in manuscript along the top. This is whose manuscript it is. Yeah, and the signature there is John Flamsteed, the first astronomer royal, one of the people who had many arguments with Newton. So this is his personal copy of the book. I wonder how he felt about this, though. He must have looked at this and thought, wow, that Newton guy, he's nailed it. I think most people, yeah, they, they would have realised it was something special. So let's just have a look at a few pages of it in printed form. And here, of course, you get the figures, and it's been annotated, so Flamsteed's gone through and thought to himself, I'll put my own ideas in the margins. Look at that, he's putting his own little marks in there. So it's a working copy, it isn't just a static book he read, it's something he used. Brilliant. Bits have been underlined, more notes there in the margin. But if we look here at the very, very back, what have we got, Keith? It's a receipt, and it's quite a remarkable receipt. It's dated 7th of July, 1691. You can just about make out the signature at the end there, Joseph Raffson. And he scribbled in the back of it to indicate that he's borrowed something. Basically, he said, I've borrowed this from John Flamsteed. Which I promise to restore on demand. So basically, Flamsteed said, you can borrow it, but only if you write in the back that you're yep. going to give it back to me. Yeah, yeah. So that's a nice little touch there. So would you have given it back? Well, this is Newton you're talking about. I wouldn't want to give this one back. I can't imagine what this is worth. Probably not as much as that, though. No, that's quite a big deal. There we go. 100 episodes, Keith. Do you think this was a good one for number 100? I think it's, it, it had to be this, didn't it? It really did have to be Newton's Principia. And the Book of Fishes. And the Book of Fishes. So let's get this straight. These three objects are all made of wood from the apple tree at Woolsthorpe Manor, where Isaac Newton grew up. That was maybe the apple tree he saw the apple fall from that made him think about gravity. Exactly right.